just want to say hi from Burundi, uh, Africa. Um, as our brother just said, uh, my name is uh, Danny Johnson. Um, and I'm really thankful to be able to be with all of you there at um, Bethany Chapel uh, today. Um, I don't think I know, I don't think I know hardly any of you, or maybe none of you who are there today. Um, I do know Rob and uh, Susie quite well, especially Susie, because she was one of uh, my teachers at Emmaus Bible College. Um, so it's through them that they, um, well, they're the ones who invited me to be able to speak with all of you today. So although I've heard that they weren't able to be here today, um, but nevertheless, uh, that's my main connection, I believe, with, with all of you. But I know that one of the great things about being part of um, the Brethren uh, and part of CMML is that you have people praying for you, even though you don't uh, know them personally. And we're really, really thankful uh, for that. What I think I want to do is start with a little bit of a presentation about what we do. Uh, the work that we do, and then end with a little bit of encouragement from the Word of God, just some verses that um, the Lord has really used to impact uh, my life uh, the last few years. So if that's okay with you all, that's what I'm hoping to do. Let me see if I can share my screen here, because I would like to let's see. Is that working? I think it's working. Let me go now to jump over here to my presentation. I'm not 100% sure this is working, but I believe you all can see that. Um, let me zoom back to Zoom real quick and make sure. Okay, good. I believe we're good to go. Okay. so. Here, I just have a couple of photos. Um, that's a photo of our family. Um, if you can't hear me, please send a chat to tell me if there's some reason you're not hearing me. But yeah, this is a photo of our family. My wife's name is Anne. Uh, we met at Emmaus uh, Bible College. Um, I did the Bible degree there. My wife did the nursing degree there. Uh, I grew up in Africa. I grew up in Burundi and in Tanzania and in Kenya. Uh, my parents are missionaries, are still currently missionaries. My, some of my grandparents, my grandparents are also missionaries in Africa. So I have a long uh, history of being uh, of mission work in, in Africa. But my wife grew up in Chicago area. Um, we met at Emmaus, got, graduated in 2010. I got married in 2010, moved to Burundi in 2012. And... Um, we moved and we had Ruth already. Ruth is nine, Lydia is eight, Elijah is six. Uh, so really uh, the two younger kids were born uh, in Burundi uh, where we work. Just a little bit of history of what we've been doing in Burundi. When we first moved to Burundi, we were in the capital city of Bujumbura for a few years. And then in 2016 is when we moved out to um, Eastern Burundi and just a little bit of background on the assembly work in Burundi. Uh, my grandparents were the ones who helped start the assembly work way back. My parents served in Burundi for a long time. Now they serve in Tanzania. But um, when we came in to work in Burundi alongside the assemblies here, the national assemblies here, uh, we found that they were just starting um, to catch a vision of church planting right when we arrived. And so they had a goal of planting um, 80 assemblies in the country. They had um, had about 120 when we moved in 2012. And so they really wanted to push and try to plant 80 uh, in the next five years. Um, it was a bit of an ambitious goal, uh, not really possible to, to do that exactly, but um, it was great to see that vision and that push to try to, to really try to focus on church planting in the country. And so in now, from, from that time till now, they've actually planted around 40, 45 believe, churches, I believe, um, in the last, since 2012. So it's been, what, um, nine years it's taken them to plant uh, 40 churches, a little over 40 churches. But just thankful that um, the Lord really laid that on the national believers' hearts to really push church planting. But that's a little background. But when we got there uh, to uh, Bujumbura, and again, we saw this vision. We, me and my wife, uh, really 
asked ourselves the question, what's our part? What's our part in this national church mu movement, um, church planting movement? Because, you know, missionaries have different roles and depending on the country, they have different roles in a church, in a country of, like Burundi, where there has been a lot of brethren missionary work. Um, we have more of a coming alongside the national church role in um, helping them do what they do, uh, just in, in partnering with them and enabling them to do uh, the, to, to come alongside them and do the work. So one thing the Lord laid on our heart was to, or the main thing he laid on our heart was to move to Eastern Burundi. Uh, it's an area as far from the capital as we can get. The capital of the city is on the western side. And Burundi is a very small country. It's about the size of the state of Maryland. So it's, it's quite small, but it's quite populated. It has about 11 million people or 12 million people. So it's um, densely populated. But uh, we have felt the call to move across the country to the poorest part of the country um, to help with church planting out there. Because we said, well, if the national church is focusing on church planting, Let's go where the national church needs the most help. Because uh, in the city, there was a lot of older, mature churches that my grandparents and parents poured into. But we felt that in Eastern Burundi, there was a lot more need, a bigger need um, for help. And so uh, we moved out there again, um, so an area with a lot younger churches, um, a lot poorer churches. Burundi overall is about the second poorest country in the world. And Eastern Burundi is the poorest uh, part of that country. And so um, we were, that, that was a, a, a calling that we felt uh, the Lord uh, led us to do. So when we moved, there were um, eight churches in the area. And since we moved in 2016, we've been, we've been involved in helping plant eight churches, um, helping coordinate, help construction, um, help in leadership training, uh, those kind of things. And so we've been really involved. That's been our main focus in moving to Eastern Burundi has been church planting. And so I want to talk a little bit about three of the, we're, we're in the process right now of planting three churches. Um, the, they're all in the area north of us. I recently been, the last year we were focusing on the area right around us, but we've been focusing on the area a little bit north of us. And so one of the church plants, um, I want to talk about is of these three is a Congolese refugee camp. Now there's a war going on in the neighboring country to us of Congo. Um, Congo is a huge country, but the area of Congo right next to Burundi is at war. And so there's quite a few refugees from Congo living in Burundi. And so we have been in contact with some of them and they really wanted, want to help us, want us to help them uh, plant an assembly in their refugee camp. And so uh, we've done some training, some teaching uh, time. We're also helping with uh, the construction of a church building there. Um, so it involves, you know, a lot of coordinating, a lot of getting permission from the government authorities of Burundi, getting permission from the camp authorities, um, coordinating materials for stuff like that. Again, also doing training. So this is just a photo of me and some of the leaders um, of, of the Congolese refugees. So that's a plant load willing that we will open in the middle of September. Um, this is a photo of the construction site. You can see they're making their own bricks. Um, then they fire them with a firewood to make them to, to harden them and make them more waterproof. Uh, and so they actually just finished I believe, firing their bricks. So hopefully they'll be starting to build the walls soon because we only have uh, about a month left before we would like to open this uh, church plant, Lord willing. So that's one you can be praying for. Um, again, this is our main focus is, is helping plant churches. So um, yeah, you can be praying for this um, church plant at the Congolese refugee camp. Life of a refugee is very hard. Um, as you know, there's not much you can do uh, when you're just sitting in a camp all day and they bring you, you know, the UN brings you food and you're not allowed to leave the camp. Um, so um, we've been able to give them a bunch of Emmaus courses as well, response courses. So we can pray for that the Lord would use those um, in the lives of these people who have a lot of time on their hands, um, that God would use this time in their lives to really help um, deepen their faith and help them to grow. Um, another church plant, again, north of us that we're hoping to launch soon is one at a town called Misugi. These are all in the province or state called Changuzo, north of us. 
Um, but this is different than the camp one because this is what we would call a hive off church plant where there's a, ch a church that we planted um, about three years ago um, near here and they were doing you know evangelism there was a bunch of people who started who got saved and started coming from further away like it was like a two-hour walk for them to come to church and so slowly by slowly you know as the more and more believers came from that area about a two hours walk away from one town near um we got the idea of wanting to plant again in that town so they don't have to walk uh so far and we've been developing some of the leaders from that town so um that's that's this is what we call a hive off church plant uh, there's about, I believe there's between 20 and 30 believers already in the town. And so that's why it's about time that we help them build a building and help send some more mature elders from a nearby church to help get the church plant off the ground. So you can pray for this uh, church plant as well. Um, I show this picture because this town um, of Misugi is actually where the first Christians came into Burundi. So um, the Catholic priest missionaries came into Burundi in 18, I believe it was 1893. I could be wrong on this, 1890 something um, that the first Catholic missionaries came into Burundi. And this is the exact spot in this town where we're planting this church, this high Baptist church is the spot where the first quote unquote Christians came into the country um but it's sad to me so this is a photo of the monument they've set up they're right now actually constructing another huge huge monument over this spot because they've kind of neglected it but the catholic church there in Burundi is now trying to make a big pilgrimage site out of it but as you can see there's three ladies there um kneeling down you know praying at the cross there um and it's a bit it's sad to me that um the place where christianity entered into Burundi, um, you know, there's not a real faithful Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church in the town. Um, so it's just sad to see that the place where we would hope would be pretty clear gospel came in originally. Um, now it's it, there's so much false teaching both uh, in the Catholic Church and in any of the several other even what they would call evangelical churches in our area, but. Um, are very, very rife with uh, false teaching. And so um, it's just an interesting full circle to, to be coming back and planting a church right where uh, Christianity first entered uh, the country. But you can pray that um, the people who are misled by false teaching um, in this town of Misugi, that uh, they would be set free. Uh, we know that there's different ways Satan attacks the church and one of the deadliest ways is false teaching. Uh, so you can pray for that. Uh, the third and final church point that's Lord willing going to happen this summer is in the biggest town north of us, it's the state capital. You can kind of see a little bit of the town in this photo in the background. Um, we were able to get a really prime, pretty a significant thing to be able to get a, a property right near the city and right on the Prairie Road. Um, and actually tomorrow is I'll be taking is when I'll be taking a construction crew up there to this place. Uh, you can see the property marked out in red on the photo um, and we'll be starting to build uh, tomorrow there uh, you can pray here this is going to be a, a, a more difficult church plant than the other two and the reason is is because we have pretty much no believers in this town already and so these other two church plants you know we're going to set to a place where there's already a core group of believers um, at this church, though, in this, this third one I'm talking about in Changuzo town, uh, we do have a church leader who lives pretty close, who will be one of the church uh, leaders here once we start the church. Um, but this will be take a lot more groundwork of doing door-to-door um, -door evangelism. Uh, we have a team um, of door-to-door -door evangelists that Lord willing will be able to bring up there the week before the church launch and get permission. You can pray we can get permission from the government. Sometimes they give permission for door-to-door -door evangelism. Sometimes they don't. Um, but you can pray that we're able to get that permission. Because uh, again, this will take a lot more groundwork here because there's um, almost no core of believers here yet. Uh, but it's a more strategic church plant. Um, we want to be able to plant in some of these bigger population centers. 
because a lot of the assemblies are in smaller population centers, uh, but we wanna target um, some of these bigger cities. So uh, that's a big, a big prayer request. This will Lord willing be the last week of September uh, when we launch this church plant. So we have the one at Misugi, Lord willing, being launched the first weekend of September, the one at the youth at the Congolese refugee camp, uh, the third week of September, or weekend of September, and then this one, the last weekend of September. So pray for us. Uh, it's going to be a busy, a busy September, uh, Lord willing. Um, I want to take a little time to talk about uh, the deaf school. Um, our brother who was introducing uh, me um, mentioned that we are involved in work with the deaf. And uh, how that happened was I've never, when I, you know, as I was growing up or even when I started doing mission work in Burundi, I never thought about working with deaf, with the deaf. But when we moved to Eastern Burundi, one of the first things we found out was that there's a really high percentage of deaf children in Eastern Burundi. And so we, we felt really burdened by that. Uh, the main reason is because there was no help being offered to them, no schooling, like um, the government had no special education program, uh, no one teaching them sign language. So basically you had a, a big, large group of deaf people who have no language, um, who are extremely isolated, um, and most importantly cannot hear the gospel because they have no way to clearly be communicated with or to express themselves. And so that just really, really burdened us because here you have a, you know, right in front of us, God plopped down a, an unreached people group um, who could not, don't have a, a language through which they can hear the gospel. And so once we kind of felt that burden, we started really researching and finding out how many. Well, we found 50 deaf kids just in our little district. And so then we just kept researching, researching, researching. And so we divided up um, those 18 districts in our Eastern Burundi the side of the country. And so we've been researching three districts every year so far. Um, this is the fourth uh, year we're doing research. But even from the first three, the first nine districts, the first three years, we've had, we have 120 children at the school. Um, just from those, so we've had, we've been finding on average, um, yeah, 40, 40 kids able to come to school every, every year, 40 new children. And so um, we have 120 at school now. Um, I mean, they're on some summer vacation right now, but even we've just done more research uh, this summer as well. Um, we were researching again in, to the north of us and we actually have identified 67 more deaf kids just from the three districts far north of us um, who are eligible to come to school. We're actually finding way more than that, but those are the ones who are who have only an issue with deafness. Sometimes we're finding a deaf kid who's also lame or has a mental illness as well. And those are at this point, those are children we can't accept. We can we're only able to accept those who have only the disability of, of deafness. And so um, yeah, it's really it's really crazy to, to see that we're finding so many uh, deaf children. So Lord willing, if, if all of these children are able to come, um, we're gonna have a huge number of deaf kids uh, this fall. So this is a photo of the facilities. We have classrooms in the foreground, then an auditorium dorm on the back left, and then dining hall and kitchen in the back. This is a side view. You can see the classrooms on the right side um, above and below. The chapel is being roofed there, and then the dorm is the big buildings to the left, and then the dining hall opposite, and the kitchen in the top corner, left corner. Um, but we're really thanking the Lord that the Lord um, has been providing for us to be able to build a school for them. It is a boarding school because most of the children have to come and stay uh, for um, the whole time. Most of them live too far away. Almost all of them live too far away to be able to go home. And also, they're so isolated from their parents because the parents don't know sign language. Well, we're starting to teach them a little bit, but they don't, they can't really communicate with people at home very well. So um, we're really building a community there. They do go home on vacations uh three times a year um but we have dorm parents here we have teachers here we're teaching the government system we're just doing it through uh, using american sign language uh, which is um, the sign language that they use down in the capital city um the deaf work is not something that i've started in burundi 
uh, my dad was actually involved in, in starting a deaf school in the capital city in the 80s. And so there has been deaf work in the capital city uh, going on, but not out in the eastern far side of the country. Um, and because we found so many, we realized there's no way we can send them all down to the city. We need to start a branch of the school up here. So that's what we've thankfully been able to do. Uh, the way we support the school is we have a child sponsorship program uh, through a ministry out of Virginia that does about child sponsorship. Um, and so that's how we're able to feed the children and pay the teachers and the dorm parents. Um, yeah, because here again, we're the second, Burundi's arguably the second poorest country in the world and we live in the poorest part of it. And most parents, a lot of parents have their kids drop out, even their hearing kids. Um, and they, at this point, most of the parents don't see much potential in their deaf children. We have to really try to help them understand that these children who are deaf really can go to school. They really can learn. They really can learn to read. They really can learn to write. Uh, they really can do all sorts of things just like any other child. They just need a language. Um, and so slowly, slowly, the parents are understanding that as they see their kids come home on vacation, you know, having learned tons of stuff. Um, so we're really uh, thankful for the opportunity to be able to, again, reach reach out with the love of Christ to the least of these. You know, the Bible says the, the last will be first, the first will be last. At this point, we probably have one of the best schools in our whole area. Um, and it's amazing how the Lord has taken, you know, a group of people who weren't getting any help as far as education to be able to um, be one of the better schools in our area. Um, and again, our main goal in the school is to be able to give them a language, the skills to be able to communicate and be communicated with so that uh, most importantly, they can hear the gospel. We have a great um, uh, culture going where the children really do uh, love to come to church. They, they, they um, come to the local church um, every Sunday when they're here at school. Um, and we already have many, many of them baptized. Um, so we're really thankful for that. Many of them have made the decision to be baptized. Uh, so we're really thankful that really the Lord has um, enabled us to disciple these children now that they're able to uh, get a language, um, learn the language of sign language. Uh, this is just a couple of photos of some of the new students or children who were identified um, this summer. Uh, this is three of the 67 uh, new potential deaf children. Um, again, it's, it's really hard. This research is really hard to do because you have to, a lot of times we'll like announce in different areas that we're coming to identify and register deaf children. The parents won't answer, they won't come when they hear the announcement to the place that we've set up, you know, to meet us um, because they don't see a value in their children. So sometimes you have to go almost house to house asking people, you know, do you know any deaf kids around here? And then you have to explain to the parents, you know, this child isn't stupid. This child can learn. This child can get an education. This child can learn to read. This child can know God, you know. Um, and thankfully, um, now that we have this, the school's been running for three years, um, their parents we can show them pictures you know we can we can help explain to them um and uh, that these children really can can learn and can um grow mentally and spiritually but you can pray uh for these 67 um that these ones that they would all come sometimes we register kids and then in the end uh, their parents don't want to send them um, so you can pray pray that they might be able to come uh, because it's just heartbreaking to me to think of these children who have the opportunity now to be able to go to school and then their parents don't want them to go, uh, don't want them uh, to be able to take, take advantage of the opportunity. So you can pray, pray for that and also pray that the Lord provides sponsors for these kids um, so that we're able to continue to feed them and take care of them uh, this next school year. One of the other things we're doing with the deaf children is a trade skills training. And the reason why we started doing that, this photo is a photo of three buildings we built for the trade training. Um, we want to teach sewing, we want to teach carpentry, we want to teach welding, we want to teach mechanics. Uh, and the main reason we want to do that is because a lot of these deaf kids we're bringing to school, um, they are older when they're coming and they have to start in kindergarten because you have to start in the lowest level, you know, even if they're 18, 19. Uh, that's about the oldest we're accepting. The oldest is about 20. And so they have to start in kindergarten. So if they're starting kindergarten in, you know, at 20 years old, there's not much chance that they're really going to be able to go all the way through even middle school. Um, we have a lot of younger children as well, like six, seven, eight starting. 
those are the children who we think will be able to get through high school or really. Um, but these older kids, we have to find another avenue for them because um, there's no way they're going to want to spend, you know, the next 12 years in school when they're already 20. So our, our um, vision with that is to have them go to school for three or four years so they can actually learn the important basic skills of reading, writing, and math um, and get that down and then um, put them into these at the same time that they're doing that, these older kids be training them in different skills so that when they finish three, four years, five years, maybe at school, uh, we can send them home, both having known how to read, you know, having ha uh, gotten a Bible, um, but then also have a skill, one of these skills to be able to be um, useful in their community. Uh, so um, we've actually been able to start this summer. We started uh, two of the branches. We were able to start carpentry and welding. So we picked uh, 13 of our older boys, as you can see, who are back now during vacation, um, making uh, benches, making uh, benches for the school, making chairs for the school, making new beds for the new students, uh, desks, all those kind of things there. So we're, we're teaching them. Uh, we figured, well, why should we buy them when, when we want to teach them these skills? So we might as well be training them. So of the 13, two, we're teaching welding because it's harder to teach a lot welding. Uh, but it's easier to teach a lot carpentry. So uh, with the between the welding and the carpentry, we're able to make some nice benches, you know, with metal legs, wooden tops. And um, so it, it's great to see them working together. And I, it's amazing to see these kids, these our students have so much excitement. Um, they're, they're doing so great. They have so much excitement. Uh, they're working so hard. Um, and they really, really are excited to be able to learn uh, these different skills. Here's another photo. Uh, this is one of the first benches we made. Uh, we're actually using them uh, already. They've already made uh, almost 40 benches in the first three weeks. So they're working really hard. Uh, that was before we varnished and was varnishing it. But um, you can see they're really proud of their, uh, their hard work. Um, I wanted to also talk a little bit about uh, youth camp work. Uh, actually, today we just finished um, our youth camp. Uh, on Wednesday, we started youth camp. Um, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, today was the finishing day. Um, and what was amazing is we were able to use the deaf school facilities because uh, most of the deaf kids are on vacation right now. And so we were able to use the dorms to host all these young people from the, there's now 16 assemblies in Eastern Burundi. And so we were able to bring all the youth, uh, most of the youth, almost all of them, it was about 250 youth from these 16 assemblies. Um, and they all came, uh, we were able to spend, you know, these four days together uh, in the word of different uh, four different sessions to our sessions each day um, on various topics uh, but it was great to be able to use the deaf school facilities uh, the kitchen the dining hall the dorms you know the chapel building which is now finished um, to be able to host the youth camp and lord willing we'll be able to keep doing this uh, each summer um, to be uh, running a youth camp like this uh, it's been a, a great blessing um, there's just a couple of photos just need to see the youth really interested, you know, taking notes, um, opening their Bibles, reading. Um, we really had a blessed time these last few days uh, with these young people. So um, I wanted to say a few prayer requests um, and talk about them a bit uh, before finishing and moving on to sharing a bit from the word and just some verses that have impacted my, my life and ministry. Um, the first is you can be praying for the desk school construction. Every year we've got different buildings we have to keep constructing uh, to keep up with the new students coming. So we're having to build at least two or three classrooms every year, depending on the size of the incoming class. Because with the deaf, we really should only have about 10 kids in each classroom with each teacher. But at this point, we have 20 kids in each classroom with each teacher. So we, um, and if with 67 kids coming in, Lord willing, in the fall, we need at least three new classrooms. So we've just started building one, but we need, still need to build two more. Um, and we have to build a new dorm because now we're going to have about, uh, again, 180 something students, Lord willing, and the dorm we have now is going to, I don't think it's going to be able to hold them all. So lots of prayer for that. The Lord would continue to provide for us to be able to keep up with the new students coming in. Um, you can pray for these new deaf students, as I mentioned before, that the Lord would keep them and bring them and that he would help their parents to understand that this is something that really can help them. But our, our deaf kids really do not like going on, our deaf students don't like going on vacation because here at school, they get three meals a day. They get to sleep on a mattress. Um, they get to have running water. Um, you know, they get to 
have friends they can talk to. They get to go to church and have someone translating into ASL for them. Um, when they go home, you know, they don't eat three times a day. They don't, they probably sleep on the floor. They don't have, you know, have to go far, far away to get water. Um, they don't have anyone to talk to really. They can, now they can kind of write and, and talk to people with writing and reading. Um, but um, whenever they come back to school, they're always so happy because they're back with their people again. I know their community. Uh, I think they say that deaf are some of the most, if you think about deaf and blind, deaf are actually probably more isolated than blind in the sense of um, so much of culture has to do with hearing and, and words um, and language. And so the deaf are very, very isolated from the culture that they're born into because they don't get so much of that culture through language uh, that, but they create their own culture, you know, with their, the people who are, are deaf like them. And so um, we've really seen that. So anyway, pray that, that the parents really see the value of this and they send the students, send the children, uh, pray the Lord provide sponsors for these kids. Um, pray for these three church plants in Changuzo. Um, we're very busy, busy, busy these next few weeks in this building. Uh, please pray for the the elders who are preparing to go and launch these church plants that are being willing, who are willing to give up their time and energy to many of them travel quite far to be able to help launch these church plants and get them started and train up new leaders. Um, pray for fruit from the youth camp. Um, we had, again, we had a great time these last few days together with these 250 youth. Um, pray that it bears fruit, uh, you know, and that God really uses this to help grow uh, the leaders of tomorrow uh, through this work. You can pray for our Mayus Correspondent School work. Again, we're doing, we have, I'm quite involved in that. We've been giving away courses in Swahili to the Congolese refugees. Um, but we also do give a lot of courses away in community. Um, I'm involved also in helping get a lot translated into community. When we first moved here, there were only, I think 16 courses in community. And now we have over 40. Um, I haven't been involved in all of them, but I've been involved in the majority of those translations, uh, translation work, praying the translator and, and following up on that. Um, so you can pray for that. Uh, we do have quite a few students here in Eastern Burundi and we're actually just starting the construction on a new office for it because right now I've been working out of the bedroom of somebody uh, who's been hosting, who's been the one who's been coordinating the MS work. But now we're finally gonna be building an office by the main road uh, where it's more visible and people can access uh, come in, you know, turn in their courses and pick up new courses a lot easier. You can pray for that. Um, you can pray for potential medical work. This is something that the Lord's laid on our heart recently. There's a piece of land next to us here where we live, um, where the government agreed that we could build a medical clinic there. Um, the medical care in Eastern Burundi is so, so bad. Uh, there is one doctor for our, there's only one real surgeon for our whole state uh, which is you know um, I don't know the exact number of uh, population of our state but it's it's one of the lowest percentages of the world of doctor to people um, and so you know he this guy travels this one doctor travels around to three different hospitals to spreads his time out between you know three major hospitals so there's a major need for medical medical work and that shows I think that's a lot of people like to ask, you know, why are there so many deaf kids in Eastern Burundi? Well, I think the main reason is a lack of medical care. So either lack of care of the mother when she's pregnant with the baby and lack of care in early childhood, um, childhood illnesses with high fevers, uh, you know, like malaria, like meningitis. Uh, and people, you know, they have to go a long ways to get medical care. Um, they might have to walk, you know, all day. And then it's not always free. The, the government is supposed to give medical care for free for little children, but a lot of times they don't have the medicine. So even if they say it's free, they don't have the medicines. So they have to go and buy the medicine from a private pharmacy, which they don't have the money for. And so you get a lot of um, childhood illnesses that could easily be treated that aren't treated quickly, um, which then result in problems like deafness. So um, we don't want to just, you know, treat the symptom and help these deaf kids. We want to help improve the the medical care of the area and help you know show the love of Christ through compassion on people and being able to help them with that major practical need. So uh, you can pray for us for that. Again, I don't, I'm not a doctor. I don't know hardly anything about medical work. Um, uh, my wife is a nurse, um, but again, she, I mean, she's very busy homeschooling any children, so I don't think she would be too involved at this point in medical work. Um, but 
that's just something that God's laid on our heart um, to do. So you can pray that the Lord helps with that, provides for that, that construction, uh, provides for all the paperwork that has to be done for that, and provides the staff for that. We do have quite a few medically trained people in the assemblies down in the city, but again, you have to try to convince those people that it's worth it to move to the poorest part of the country to serve, you know, rather than serve as or work as a medical professional down the city where the pay is better. Um, yeah, you can pray that the Lord, if he has this, if this is what he wants, that he would put a, a vision and calling in, in people's hearts as well, that we would be able to get the staff, the skilled staff we need, uh, Lord willing. Again, we haven't started anything with that, but that's just a vision of work that we feel the Lord is uh, calling us into to help facilitate um, that and coordinate the beginning of that. Uh, one other prayer request, sorry, I'm taking a long time on this prayer request, um, but there's a women's conference in uh, Bujumbura, the capital city this week, uh, which is going to be nationwide. All the assemblies in Burundi, which is 160 something assemblies are going to be sending um, women to this conference. Uh, and my wife is going along with uh, 40, I think women from 40 something women from our local church here. And so um, you can pray for that time as all the women from all over the country are going to be together. It'll be um, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday of this week. So I'll be home with the kids, uh, busy with coordinating a lot of this construction stuff. Uh, and will be down there at the retreat. So you can pray, pray for that. Uh, last prayer request to be furlough plans. We are hoping to go come back to the U.S. in October uh, and be back about two months. So come back you know, towards the beginning of October and leave around the middle of December uh, to come back to Burundi. Uh, so you can pray for us for that, that we be able to get all the work done we need to get done before we go, that the Lord would help us as we make our furlough plans um, and would keep the work going well while we're gone. Um, so that's um, some prayer requests. Let me say thank you all for praying for us. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, that the Lord, we pray that the Lord would remind you all to, to keep us in prayer with these things. Let me go back now to here and stop sharing my screen. And I think you guys can all still see me. Um, and let me just end, I think, our time today by looking at a few uh, verses um, that God has put on my heart, that God has really used in my life to um, make me into who I am and really impacted my my life and work. Um, the first would be in, uh, the first passage I want to go to is in Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 through 26. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 through 26, which says, I think most of us are familiar with this passage, but Paul says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruit for labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. And as I was uh, you know, going to Emmaus and um, also just thinking about what God has for me in life, you know, this passage really impacted me because um, especially that phrase where he says, you know, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain, those two different phrases he has there um it just made me think a lot about what does that actually mean you know um to die is gain why does paul say you know to die is gain um well he says um my desire you know in verse 23 he continues and says with the same idea my desire is to depart and be with christ for that is far better um you know you think of that verse in psalms psalm 16 11 it says, in your presence is fullness of joy, and that your right hands are pleasures forevermore. Um, and how in this life, um, we never can have fullness of joy. We can never have pleasure that lasts. Um, one thing in my life that made me realize that was uh, when my wife and I first got pregnant uh, with our firstborn, uh, we've actually found out we were having twins, which is so exciting. Uh, we had 
uh, pregnant with twins. Um, and then when it came to give birth, actually, uh, we found out that the older twin uh, was born, was, was stillborn, um, and then the younger twin was born fine. Um, and that was a real difficult time in our life because um, we had such mixed emotion. It was so much joy at having your first child, new time parents, you know, first baby, uh, all the joy connected with that is amazing. But then at the same time, you're also grieving the loss of a child. So it was a, it was a really difficult mixed time because, you know, you would go from grieving to, you know, huge, amazing joy of having a newborn child. And I think that really, um, that really impacted my heart in realizing that um, all the joy and all the pleasure, you know, all the joy we have here is mixed joy. It's always going to be mixed with sadness because we live in a broken world. Uh, you know, we live in a world that we can't have um, full joy. Um, you know, we can't have pleasure that lasts. Um, but we know that in God's presence, there's fullness of joy. It's not going to be mixed uh, when we get to see him, when we get to live with him in eternity. It's not going to be mixed joy. It's not going to be mixed with any sadness. Um, it's going to be full joy. And it's going to be pleasure that lasts forever uh, with no end. Um, and I think that's why, again, Paul and Philippians can say to die is gain. He says to die is gain because it's far better. It's far better to be with Christ. And we know that that's only because Christ came and redeemed us. Um, he died in our place. He rose again. And now uh, we can have new life with him. We have hope of eternal life uh, with him. And so that's why, you know, Paul can say this a crazy phrase, um, to die is gain. You know, as I was thinking about that, that just made me think, well, then if that's true, and we know that's true, why am I still here? You know, I, as a young person, I thought about that. Like, why, when I'm saved, does God not just, did God just take me? Because if to die is gain, if to be with Christ is far better, why why is he keeping me from that thing that is far better, right? And so um, it's kind of like, you know, there's a party going on and you can't come into the party yet. <laughs> you know, it's not time yet, it's not time yet. Um, and in one sense, it's kind of like, what's going on? Why won't you give me what's far better yet? And, um, you know, that's where Paul says, and that amazing phrase, to live as Christ. Um, he says, um, if I am in verse 22, if I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Meaning he realizes that if God still wants him to keep living, he keeps giving him, you know, keeps his heart beating, keeps his lungs working. Um, there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. And the reason is to do fruit for labor. And so another verse that goes along with that, that really impacted me was from Ephesians 2. If you could turn there, Ephesians 2. We all know the verses 8 and 9, you know, that are so amazingly clear about grace and faith and it not being a result of works. Let's go ahead and read in verse, so Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, but uh, start in verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. Then verse 10 is what really impacted me and goes along with what Paul says in Philippians. It says, for we are his workmanship, <clears throat> created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That verse just blew me away because it made me realize that's why. That's why, that's why God's not giving me gain yet, right? Um, the only reason, you know, as a Christian, I think simplistic, obviously we can talk about very complicated, many reasons, but simply speaking, the only reason we as Christians continue on here once we're saved is because there's good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, we're his workmanship in created in Christ Jesus when we're born again um, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. And so that verse really impacted me because it made me realize the amazing truth that God has work for me to do that he prepared and planned before the creation of the world. Um, he prepared beforehand that I should walk in them. And that does several things for me. It gives me such an amazing purpose in life to realize that, wow, the reason my heart is beating, the reason my lungs are working is because there's specific work that God has planned for me and he's going to help me do it. That's the second thing that is so encouraging is that as long as there's still work for me to do, God's going to strengthen me. God is going to give me grace. God is going to keep me working. He's going to protect me to get that work done. And that's just so emboldening to me because it's like, 
you know, as one of the early church fathers said, you know, I am immortal until my work is done. I think he was coming from this, getting that from this idea of these verses is saying, you know, until my work is done, God's going to be with me. And if he's with me, what can stand against me? And, you know, even, even when my work is done, he's still with me because even death can't separate me from, from the love of uh, Christ. Like our brother was reading this morning in Romans, um, in Romans eight, you know, but that's just this, th that verse was just so, so encouraging uh, to me. And it's just been a major life verse to me to realize that um, I can take heart. I can have the strength I need. Um, I can look to God and know that he will answer. I can look to God and know that he will enable me. I can look to God and, not, and find encouragement and find strength to do the difficult work he's called for me to do. It's not to say our work that he's prepared for us to do is easy. Uh, you know, it's, 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 well, in one sense, it's impossible. It's impossible work because it has to do with changing people's lives and hearts that we become a part of, but we know that his spirit, um, his spirit will enable us to do that. His spirit will strengthen us to do that. Um, we can know that um, he will enable us to do it. He will strengthen us to do it because it's work that he prepared uh, beforehand that we should walk in them. And so, you know, we should do what Paul um, tells Timothy, talks to Timothy about in 2 Timothy 2, you know, we want to be a vessel, right, uh, for honorable use, ready for every good work. Actually, that was the theme of our camp this week, um, was that from some 2 Timothy 2, 20, 21, um, you know, how can we then now that we know that there's a reason why we're here alive, still here on earth, and it's to share the gospel, it's to do the work that God has called us to do, um, but we need to be good vessels. We need to be um, honorable vessels, ready for every good work, um, vessels for honorable use, um, holy vessels. Uh, we need to be people who do bear the fruit of the spirit um, in our lives so that we can be useful, useful servants of God um, in the work and for the work that he's called us to. And so that's the verses that God laid on my heart to be able to share with you all, just from my own encouraged uh, personal experience and my own testimony of what there were some of the verses that God's used in my life to really impact me and strengthen me um, and, you know, give me the vision and, and strength I need uh, to serve him. Um, and so um, I pray that that's an encouragement to all of you, um, that each one of us, each one of us have a master who has work for us to do, who's prepared us prepared work he has already prepared that work for us to do and he's going to enable us uh, to do it um, so that's what the lord's light in my heart may god bless all of you i'm not sure how you want me to end this but that's what i have for all of you thank you all very much may god bless